Hello and welcome to Yokangai, a survivor story. My name is TJ Arlett and I have with me here the beautiful Asha who has come to share her moving story of how she, what she had been through in her life. I was uh, born in the Congo and uh, I grew up in a single mother family. My mother and my father were separated and um, my mum I would say was a hustler mum or go-getting mum so she wasn't your outdoor you know at home mum. So uh, I grew up with uh, three maids so I had a male and two females that looked after me while my mum was at work. So, this is where I would say where my story um, in the abuse started because my mum would go to work, leave me at home with my three maids, sorry, and uh, one of them would take advantage of me as my mum would be away. Yeah, and it kind of became the norm because when mum would go to work, that's what would take place at home. It was like a kind of a routine she would do whatever she would do to me and when mum would come back it would just be like it was a normal thing i don't i don't even think it was i didn't even realize that it was a naughty thing she would just say oh you know can i ask you asha um where were the other maids because you had three didn't you yeah. at the time where were they um, when some of this would take place everyone kind of had a different role one was the cook and the other the male one, he was like my dad, he was like my protector, but I couldn't tell you where he was when this happened. I'm guessing, because the maid that did that, she was the one that kind of looked after me and the washing and all that. I don't know, maybe they thought she was just cleaning me up or whatever not, but I couldn't tell you. Okay. Yeah. So when you guys moved, then you left those particular, all of those maids behind? Um, yeah, when or? we moved, it was due to like, other circumstances and then I just only had one maid and it was the male one and that's who I kind of grew up with but thereafter it was um I was abused by three different people just to put it out there and the first lady was the maid okay. and um obviously the maid was at a young age like I said I just brushed it aside but what I found is that from that she took away my innocence and I kind of now, I don't want to say I liked it, but I, I, I knew that there was a sensation down there that made me feel a certain way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, was, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right, isn't it? Because yeah. we're humans, we have these bodies and these bodies react to certain things, don't they? Just tell me more about what would happen in the first house with that main maid who you said would look after you personally who would do the private and the intimate care for you? I would say most of it always happened in my mum's room because I remember because I can visually like see it. And um, the memory that I have is like, you know when you're changing a child's nappy? Yeah. That's how, how she would have me. Okay. And then she would just have her way with me. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't tell you how long it lasted. But that's basically what she did. And I'm guessing everybody else would just think that she's, you know, maybe I don't I don't think I was wearing nappies, but she just might be just cleaning me up or um whatever not. And um I even remember a day my mum was coming back home, because you know, you bib the horn and they will open the and she was she was coming back and she stood me up and she took me to the bathroom and washed my mouth and you know, to clean me up and you know, she would do the usual don't say nothing. And uh, yeah, that would kind of be like the thing that would happen constantly. And then when mum would be back, how would you react? How would you talk to mum? Because they were obviously your support network, weren't they, the three maids? Um, I mean, I guess I was just too young to even know what was happening to me was, wasn't supposed to happen. Because okay. it was like a, a routine. Okay. Yeah. It was, to me, at that age, it was nothing wrong. It was just our little secret 
for me and her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It was our little secret. It wasn't even a secret, in fact. I didn't know it was wrong to not tell it. Right. Yeah. I just knew that, just don't tell mum. Okay. And then, so, you would say this went on for how long? I couldn't tell you. I actually, I don't actually remember. But when I vividly think about it, and the images that I have, it, um... I only can see one, maybe because I was too young, but I only can vividly remember one. Like I can close my eyes and see myself lying there on the floor <sighs> with my legs open. And then she she'd just do whatever she's doing to me. And it was just normal at the time. Yeah. Now I want to ask you actually to talk about when you moved on to the second house because that's where you were a little bit older, like you said, closer um, to your yeah. son's age. Just tell me about, tell me more about what happened there. After that, we moved into my auntie's house. And at my auntie's house, it was the same thing. My mum always gone or she's away or whatever not. And um, there was a whole stigma, you know, Basia Pembe, Basala Kabandumba, Basia Metis, you know, that's always been with me from even when I was born. So... When um, my uncle would behave a certain way, I didn't want to say anything because it would be my fault. Like little things, like for example, being at my auntie's house, I remember we had, um, yeah, we had builders over and they was acting, you know, very perverty towards me and I got the blame for it. Um, I, yeah, I think at that age, I think I'm about seven, eight or so, and now I'm aware that I have this stigma on my head of the light skin, mixed race, you know, man of my beer thing on my head. So now I'm a little bit more careful with what I do. And um, if men trouble me, because that happens so often. What does often, that mean, trouble me? Oh, Oh, I could tell there was just silly things that I'd be going to school and men would be like, oh, and just all of that stuff, or they would try and speak to you. And, and I was that young, but it still happened. I remember I couldn't walk to school on my own because of that. I had to go to school with, you know, the maid, the man maid, yes, just to stop that from happening. The yeah, but then it would be blamed on me. Mm. Yeah. How did you... How did you know that they were blaming it on you at such a young age? Because from when I was young, a lot of my aunties, my mum's sisters, it was always, there's always this Métis thing. Even my mum, she would say, when she gave birth, one of her sisters told her, ah, but Métis, oh, you have a problem. So it was just like, bef yeah, so already I have that stigma on my head. And like I said, when I would say something, or if I would say that a man had troubled me, it would always be my fault. So I already knew that, forget it. And, oh, 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 you know, oh, you be by Métis, that's how they are. It was always by Métis. So living at my auntie's house now, um, my mum wasn't always there. I was with my auntie. And um, sometimes I ask myself, did I make him feel comfortable to, to, you know, come in my room at night? <laughs> but then I was seven, eight. This uncle, they're calling him uncle. What would he do? Come into your room? Why? Um, at night, the first time it happened, I think I was sleep. Well, I was definitely sleeping, and I've heard someone come in my room, but I didn't think nothing of it, you know but I didn't wake up either. So I just, I just thought maybe he's just coming to get something from the room. I mean, it was their house and I was sleeping in the spare room and he's come in and then I felt him just on top of me. And I froze and I did not move. Yeah, I remember I was lying on my face and I had my arms because I sleep with my arms by my side and I just, I did not move. I, I just stayed there and just let him thrust on top of me. And then I guess when he was finished, he walked out and I carried on pretending I was sleeping. 
And now I think to myself, imagine if I had engaged with it. Nah. How far would why he have would you gone? Think that, well, why would you think it would make him behave any different should you have engaged with it? I don't know. These are just questions I ask myself. And then he done it again and again and again. But then I guess he knew I was awake and that I didn't do nothing. I don't know. Sometimes I blame myself. Maybe I should have told someone. No, Asha, you must never, ever blame yourself. These were adults who knew what they were doing. Yeah, they were not innocent like you were innocent. You were the innocent party in all of this. And so you must never, ever blame yourself and think that somehow if you had behaved differently, that these people would have chosen to behave differently. I know, but I, but I can't lie. It still resonates in the back of my head that maybe if I had told an adult at that time, he may have stopped. The fact that he reoccurrently came back, maybe he would have stopped coming back if I said something. What do you think would have happened if you did say something to your aunt or to your maid, the maids that were looking after you? I probably would have got told off and got told I couldn't live there anymore. But isn't that maybe subconsciously what you might have been scared of? Because before, these light-skinned girls, are, the narrative was, these light-skinned girls are really, you know, yeah. and Dumba, as you described it, to use your own words, these light-skinned girls are trouble. So perhaps that's what was in the back of your mind. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. E even telling the story now, I, I know it's probably a lot are going to use it against me. Why didn't you say something earlier? You know, why now? People um, who are watching you now and the courage that you're showing to come forward and speak, they will then be encouraged to speak. So maybe you might think that it's too late for you. However, for the people watching you, it's not too late for them. I hope so. That, that is why I'm here. I'm hoping that, you know, my courage would encourage someone else to, someone that is currently going through it, or maybe has been through it. Because, um, you know, I'm a very private person, but at the same time, that privacy is killing me. <laughs> yeah. You are paving a way for lots of other young women. I hope so. And they'll so. be able to have the courage to be able to come forward and, and tell, you know, and speak up. Because in our community, what we have is called Yeah, they protect the, the, the perpetrators, don't they? Because of the shame of the eglise, shame your family, shame of all sorts of other people apart from the victims. Exactly. Yeah? But for the people who are going through it. Because if you speak, then somebody else will be exposed. Exactly. But that kind of behavior is what we're trying to stop in a community. We're trying to educate the community and say, no, you have to treat the villains are the perpetrators. It's those people who are taking advantage. And we should be supporting those who are survivors or those who are going through it. Do you know why I laughed? Because I, want, I half discussed this with one of my cousins and she said to me, um, Na kinchasa mental health is a lot day. When is upon a bino bana poto? Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I thought to myself, no. Mm. Like we we're, we're all suffering the same way, but we just have different ways of dealing with it. Absolutely. And here we we, we have a little bit more support mm. because maybe we have, I don't know, the police, the government, or you know, whereas back home if you took it to your pastor or to your auntie or to your mum, the initial thing they're going to do is protect the person who's done it, protect the husband because they don't want that marriage to break down because you're the bad person for speed. Even up until now, I'm, I can't lie to you. I am scared of what's to come. Don't be scared. Don't be scared, Asha. Don't be scared. There are people behind you who are supporting you, who will continue to support you because what you're doing is not wrong. You need to really believe that. Do you believe that? What you're doing is not wrong. You're doing the right thing. Do you know what I believe? Honestly, half of me thinks I'm being selfish because I'm thinking about me and my well-being and how I'm coping with this and how me speaking my truth will free me. And then half of me thinking, you know, like I said before, there are people currently going through this, maybe even worse. I'm telling you, I've spoken to other women that have been um, sexually abused. And do you know how we speak about it? Have you been sexually abused? Oh yeah, me too, yeah. Who was it, your uncle? Yeah, cool, cool. That's how we talk about it. It's, it's like a normal thing.
especially in our community. Who was it? Oh, your uncle. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's so normal. But then it's not normal. It's not. It's not normal. Yeah. Absolutely. It, but it's so wide, widespread in our community. And because nobody would talk about it or be as brave as you're being and come forward and speak. Actually, this is wrong. What happened to me was wrong. If nobody is saying that, can you imagine? I mean, we're in a world where people are a bit more keba keba in La Porto. People are a bit more scared. But can you imagine the girls, the women who are still living in Africa, what they must be going through? There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a, a beautician and I tell you, I sit and I listen to stories from women and it breaks my heart. And I've only told you my story, I would say in comparison to these women, it doesn't even stand up <laughs> next to what but they're going through. But this is your truth, though, but this is still your truth. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's impacted on you. We're going to come to that in a moment. But you did mention, though, Asha, that there were three people. Yes. So just tell us a bit more about who the third person, um, what happened. So now we, we've moved to Europe now. I, I, at this time, we lived in Spain. Again, my mum's a working mum, always has been. Not playing that down. I'm happy that I came from a working mum. But um, when she would be working, I would stay with uh, another girl who was, um, she was not much older than me. How old am I? I think I'm in year six at this point. No, year five. So I can't remember how old I am, but I'm in year five at this point, And I'm with this cousin who is a bit more promiscuous than me she's a little bit naughty so um she's dating a guy who's older than her and she's asked me to go with her to the house so as we've gone to the house she's with his friend and she's gone into the room with her boyfriend and I'm just sat there like you know twiddling my fingers just I think slightly um, naive to it all or, or now that I'm looking back is it was clearly some kind of a setup or maybe she thought I would be willing to do what she was doing and um, yeah he's asked me to go in the room with him and um, I don't know if I knew what was going to happen I don't know what I've gone into the room I just remember um, fighting to stop him but he's making it like a play fight like it's a joke but I'm I wasn't joking I was actually fighting for nothing to happen and it was a fight continuously and continuously and it, and he said to me oh you know she's doing it in there you know it's nothing wrong you should just you know you should do it too and um yeah <laughs> Yeah, that was the first time it happened, and I, that one, I, I have not told anyone that one. Yeah, because I kind of half felt like I, I gave consent, but I didn't really give no, consent. You didn't because you put up a fight, didn't you? I put up a fight, I'm telling you, it was for so long. <laughs> So I just want to be really clear, you did not give consent. You were a minor. So anything that would have happened to you in that room was rape. It's as simple as that. There's no way that you gave consent. Even if you said yes, you cannot give consent under age like that. But I'd say in my head at the time, and I don't think I told anyone because I made myself believe that it was my fault. You know, I willingly went with my cousin, I willingly walked in that man's room. And although I put up a fight initially, at the end, when I'd then been told that she's doing the same thing, I was just like, oh, OK, maybe I should do the same thing. So, you know, like we'd say, na funda kite, because I let it happen. Yeah. Do you understand now? No, yeah. Now I understand because now I, 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 as a mum and at the age that my child is, I'm just imagining how would he at his age give consent to someone? Absolutely. <laughs> so now I understand. I, I was taken advantage of. I think it's finally hit me. I was raped. Yeah. Not once, not twice, three times. And all that is before I was even a teenager. And that is not normal. No, it's not. 
it's not normal. And that's why you're here. And I keep bringing you back <laughs> yeah. to this point. Because and there again, are many people going through that. And you can't say nothing because of the whole taboo. Like, even though I've said this here like this, I don't think I'll ever go out there and call myself oh, a rape victim or rape survivor. I wouldn't even want to attach the rape story to myself because it doesn't have a nice, I don't know how what word to use. It's just not a nice thing to have attached to you. But it, what happened to you was not nice. None of it, no part of it was nice. After we lived in Spain, we've moved here in England. Um, you know, we've got the whole gangster girls and whatever not. And I, I finally got a backbone, I would say. And um, um, unconsciously, I became like a bit of a fighter. You know, I was fighting boys in school. You know, I was that don't take no beep from no one. And now I'm thinking about it. Maybe I am like that because of what has happened to me in the past. You know, I've always had that thing of fam swa sumis and Ash is not the sumis fam. Maybe I'm not that sumis fam because of what the om did to me. Yeah, that, that, that when you're talking about you fighting boys and, and finally fighting back, did you find that you were fighting everybody and anybody were you picking particularly on boys or men to fight? Um, I wouldn't say I would pick on them, but whenever I felt the slightest piece of disrespect, I would rise up to it. I was not on it. Yeah. And um, I don't know if it's because of that, but now that I'm analyzing it, because like I said, whatever had happened to me in the past, I kind of brushed it behind me. Not because I wanted to, it just, I just didn't speak about it. So when, it, when you've gone through sexual trauma, because that's what it's about, let's name it that, when you've gone through that, people react differently. Mm. And some people become really, they kind of overcompensate, they become hypersensitive, hyper this, hyper, hyper everything, which kind of explains some of your yeah. behavior towards people who the slightest bit of disrespect and you would jump on it. Yes. And, and then if you think about perhaps your parenting, you've got a son, are you hyper, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of protective over him? Funny enough, I speak to my son a lot mm -hmm. and I explain to him no one should touch you in places they shouldn't touch you this is your private area only mum dad and I've even given him a selection of family members can and he knows that so whenever he will go to someone's house he will come back I will speak to him because I know my child so if he behaves a certain way I know something is wrong so I will make sure that I question him over and over until whatever's bothering him comes out, just to ensure. So I would say, am I? Over yeah, I'm overprotective. And, and what about your support, your support network now, as an adult? Are you, do you trust that support network? Um, when we moved to England, my mum became my best friend. Okay. Yeah, we now started, we, we spoke about everything. So she's now my number one support but she's unaware of whatever had gone on in the past. And that's why I'm a bit worried because this is how she's gonna find out. Which is interesting because you're an adult now, Asha. And you're still, I'm not sure what's keeping you from telling mum. Can you just tell me what um, you think is keeping you from telling mum? Because um, my mum works so hard to raise me, right? Because not only she's a single parent, so she worked extra hard to provide for me and make sure I never lacked anything, which I never did. But she worked so hard on making sure that side was well, that she missed out the other. Um, why I'm scared to tell her is because I don't want her to feel guilty. I don't want her to feel like, you know, she wasn't a good mum because she's an amazing mum. In fact, she's a top class mum. So you're almost protecting mum. Yeah. So the guilt and shame that you felt, you don't want mum to feel, you don't want mum to feel the yes. same guilt and shame. Yes. Yes. Because whatever I go through, whatever um, pain I go through, my mum carries it heavy. And so if I tell her that she, 
no, that's not going to sound right. I don't want to say she's the reason. No, no, no. She, the fact that she was unable to protect me, although she thought she was protecting me by having three maids, instead it had a re reverse effect. Um, You're very protective over your mum. I'm you? very protective over my mum. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. She, she's, can see she's my everything. That's why I don't want her to think she failed because she did her best. And it's the people she trusted that failed her. That's it. Yeah. And so, how, how, Asha, what would you say to other mums, whether they're single mums or not? Like you said, your mum did what she thought was best. Yeah. She safeguarded you with the support network of people who mm -hmm. she believed would be there to protect you, make sure you were fed, make sure you were, you know, you you were looked after while she was out working. Well, how can parents now? safeguard their children against people who choose to behave like that? I would say, as an, I would use myself as an example because I'm a working mum and I work all day long, but um, I make sure I communicate with my son. As young as he is, we speak. If he goes to his dad's house or he doesn't really go many places, but wherever he's at, he's got his iPad, I will FaceTime him. I ask him, are you okay, a thousand times a day. So I would say, speak to your children. Have, you know, we have that thing in our community where a parent and a child can't be friends. Of course, I'm my child's friend. There's limits to that friendship, but he knows that whatever, he can speak to me. And what I do as well, I don't, um, I don't shout at him too much because that also instills a fear in him that, oh, if I do something wrong, mum's going to shout. And that was my fear. I didn't want to tell my aunties or all that because I knew that there was that stigma that followed me of the light-skinned girl, whore, mm. you know. So I was scared that if I do say that, it would be used against me. So I would say, speak to your child and understand that it's okay to make mistakes. Or, you know, if you feel you've done something wrong, still speak to me and then we'll, you know, find a way to fix it. Now the system's different in, in Europe, isn't it? So here we have DBS checks. We have ways in which we can try to protect children from the adults that we leave them with. That's, that doesn't exist in the, in the Congo. It doesn't exist here. Um, Would you recommend that people go through the proper channels when they're gonna leave their child with somebody? I would say to you, again, DBS or no DBS, if it's your uncle or your cousin raping you at home, they're not running DBS checks on the people you live with because the government trusts that these people are protecting you and are looking after you, you know, they're because they're family. And so I would say it can only work to a certain extent. The only way it would work is through communication and parents not making the person abused feel like they've done something wrong. So we're letting them have the freedom to speak yes. up and, and, and tell their truth, no matter how long. And to be believed, when they speak, believe the child first. Someone asked me, because I spoke to someone prior to doing this, and they said to me, now that you're saying this, what are you hoping for? Like he said, so, you know, what do you want to achieve from this? Why, why are you telling it? Mm. It's, you know, do you want the person to get arrested? You know, in our community, it's not going to look good. You're going to mess up someone's marriage and so on and so forth. And I just sat down and thought, this is the mindset. This is the conditioning that is keeping people like me to live at home with this big sanduku in my heart. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to speak my truth. And this is my story. And I can share it as much as I want to because it makes me feel better. Absolutely. And also it can help another sister who is going through it to know that she's not alone. Because some of those people that we protect by not speaking our truths, when we protect those people, what happens is they continue to do exactly. that to other people. Exactly. And they must be stopped. What do you need now? What help, support? Who do you need now? Up until about a week ago, I didn't think I needed any help. I thought I was okay. I didn't even think I had a problem. And now that I've dug up this story from the cupboard back there, so it's like I'm on step one of recovery. Um, I guess as I go through it, 
I would know what Nida help. I, I couldn't tell you what Nida help, but I, I'm just what talking about, yeah, what help I need. Just talking about it yeah. is, I feel good. Good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because you started by saying, you know, like, I, was, I was petrified. Yeah. I talk. Somebody's I was. Life, marriage will be destroyed. What about me? What about you? Yeah. <laughs> what about us? You know, what about the millions of women that are going through it and think it's normal for your uncle to come into your room and sleep with you? Mm. I'm going to say, it's not normal. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the help, I think as we go, I'm welcoming any help available to me out there. Anyone that is going through it that has maybe shared their story, I'm happy to liaise with anyone that can help me that's gone further than I have um, because I don't know what's to come. I'm scared and I'm optimistic and I'm, you go girl. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you scared about? Uh. Um, although I'm not one to be bothered about what the community has to say, I am still worried about that. What do you think will happen if they hear the truth? Her, my auntie would despise me. Okay, so you think she would blame you? 100%. Wow, okay. 100%. Yeah. Because not only am I the mixed race whore, I'm now the divorced mixed race whore. So it's even and double and stigma. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. So, um, yeah. And, and what, what do you think, actually, just as kind of, as we try to close this, what do you, why, why is there this taboo in this community about people talking about sexual abuse? What do you think, where do you think it comes from? Because we all know it's happening. We're all busy protecting damaged marriages. Because mm. <laughs> a lot of our aunties, sorry to say, they're aware of what their husbands are doing and they continuously protect them. And I could not tell you why. Because I believe that they're more worried about having a marriage than how their children are affected or they, whoever it is that is affected. That, I, yeah, that's the main issue. And it's interesting how there's so many women that, you, as you're describing, who will protect their men first before they protect the children. Protect their men, protect their sons. Um, yeah, because there's mothers that are aware that their sons are raping even their sisters and still protect them. If I knew my son raped someone, maybe it's easy for me to say it now, but I'm so sorry, we're walking to the police station or maybe you need some therapy. Maybe, you know, there's also men in our community that have been abused. Absolutely. So it's not just women. Mm -hmm. It's happening across and the board. And maybe from that abuse, he's now the abuser. And that's the common pattern, isn't it? From being abused, they now become the abuser. And um, I would say how to maybe stop that or slow it down or break in that cycle, talk about it. You know, you don't always need a, what is it, a psychiatric, I always say it wrong, psychiatrist? psychiatrist. Yeah, you don't yeah. always need one. Yeah. Speak to your mum, speak to your dad. Mums and dad, make it okay for your child to speak to you about these things. Because if they can't speak to you, who are they going to speak to? I mean, in Europe, you have teachers. Absolutely. But back home, I believe if you even told your teacher, mm -hmm. to mum and dad, and you get in trouble for talking about things like that. For exposing people like that. But here we have a system. There are school systems, there's safeguarding teams, child, protecting, child protection teams, the police, you know. But how do we save our people back there? That, that's what, that's what I want this. One step at a time there. <laughs> I know, no, yeah. that's what I would like for this whole movement to expand to later, help the ones back home that maybe don't have this support system that we have over here. I think the narrative is changing in the Congo. I think there are small, very tiny steps where there are changes happening and people are talking about it more. And people know that the justice system has risen up again. Mm -hmm. People are now able to go forward and know that actually that person might actually now finally get taken to court and that there'll be a hearing mm -hmm. if they're brave enough to do that. I yeah. really hope so. That's it. I'd like everyone to just 
talk about it and maybe I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's that easy to just move on and crack on but I feel good good yeah good I, I feel good yeah I, I've got a final question for you it's, it's such an inspiring story such a powerful story that you tell have you ever thought about uh, gathering a group of women together and talking to them about mothers especially and talking to them about it or even putting it in a book I shall I mean I certainly would buy it one step at a time like you said um like I said I'm quite a private person so just this alone is a lot for me um I would love to speak to other women that are going through this in fact I'm happy for anyone to reach out to me maybe them speaking to me will help me and vi you know and vice versa so um that's what i want you know it's not the end of the world i don't want to say that may be minimal you know maybe that makes me make it sound like their pain is not pain but it isn't the end of the world um yeah it isn't the end of the world you know some people are stronger than others they can you know and keep going some people aren't some people are currently maybe crying every day for years on end um I just want to say to that sister, you know, reach out, speak to someone, don't carry that burden alone because it's not normal. I'm going to keep saying it is not normal. It's not right. It's rape and it's wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Asha, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us and for listening um, to this story that Asha has to say. Um, Yoka is here to support victims. They're here to give support to survivors. So please get in touch and ensure that you get your story heard or you get the support that you need. If you've been affected by what you've heard today, there are agencies and support networks that we can put you in touch with. So please get in touch. Thank you. <laughs>